Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. As always, hello there, I'm your host Simon. What happens here? One of my writers in this case, Arnaldo, has written me a script. Um... <laughs> Should load it up. Good professionalism there, fact boy. Let's go. Uh, it's the case of Yara G. Science Against Monsters. If you're new here, I've not read this before. Clearly, it's what we call a cold read. I'm going to read it to you. We're going to explore it together. It's, uh, well, sometimes they say it's going to be fun and then it ends up being horrible. So uh, I'm just I'm going to stop saying that. It's also, this is a true crime show. So also, what the f*** did you expect? Let's go. Sure. Good. Let's go. Hello everybody, my name is Yara and I'm in the 8th grade. I'm 13 years old. Oh no, don't do this to me. I picked this one because I was like, it doesn't have too much of a brutal title. I recorded two episodes back to back yesterday and then I was like, no, no more. No more murder, please. Uh Arnaldo. And I picked this one because it was like Science Against Monsters. This will be fun. And immediately we're into a 13 year old girl. Please don't be the victim. Sometimes it's hard to know what that is. And I'm a thin girl with brown eyes and rather long wavy hair. I love fashion, even though my clothes are not very fashionable. My favorite actor is Johnny Depp. My favorite movie is Step Up. I love pizza, fries, and sweets. My dream is to travel. This is how Yara, barely a teenager, introduced herself to her pen pals. I'm sure many of us can recognize in this description our own daughters, nieces, or younger sisters. Yeah, my kids are too young for this, but it is exactly the sort of thing you can imagine. It's the sort of thing you imagine writing about yourself oh, when you're 13. <laughs> it's like, what do you want to do? Travel around the world, eat sweets, pizza, love Step Up. I don't know what Step Up is, but um, it must be, you know... <laughs> The sort of movie a 13-year-old girl enjoys. Just out of childhood, on the brink of her teenage years, some photos of her taken a few weeks apart show us the endearing, almost goofy smile uh, of a little girl with retainers. Clearly the smile of a girl who definitely loved sweets and had to be seen by a dentist once a month. Other photos show us a different Yara, a teenager, a young lady training for one of her beloved gymnastic competitions. Her gaze is focused determined, projected towards a future made of discipline, success, and the travels she dreamed of. In a fair world. Oh, oh, now do I know where you're going? Why do we have to do an episode about child murder? In a just world, nothing and no one should have come between a 13-year-old and her dreams. Yet far too often, life gets in the way. Many of us have had our aspirations dampened or quashed by those things, those people who made us roll our, roll our eyes as teenagers. Schools, bullies, lame parents, to name a few. The Yara's dreams would be cut down by something far more sinister and insurmountable on a cold autumn morning. As Yara returned home from her gym on a cold autumn evening, a monster got in her way. The Vanishing It was November 2010. Yara Gambarazio had led a quiet life with her parents and siblings in the little town of Upper Brembata in the province of Bergamo, an hour's drive north of Milan, northern Italy. What I have to say I like about Arnaldo is that I've never heard of this case before. And what's nice, Arnaldo is Italian. He actually lives in the UK, which is fun. He lives, uh, you know, where I come from, obviously. <laughs> Thanks for that detail, Simon. Brilliant stuff. Um, but what I like is he has all this familiarity with these Italian cases, so they're, they're less familiar to me. I hope they're less familiar to you. And uh, it's nice to be able to explore them, isn't it? I mean, again, Simon, don't say nice. Don't say fun. <laughs> Jesus. You don't think he's crazy? No. He's not crazy. The inhabitants of Bergamo and the surrounding towns have a reputation for being solid, honest, hard-working people. Much of the economy of the area rests on the broad shoulders of the construction business. The burger mask building contractors enjoy an almost legendary reputation for their productivity and skill. A Milanese comedian used to joke that if the Berlin Wall had been built by bricklayers from Bergamo, the hell it would have come down. And we would still be enjoying the niceties of the Cold War. Ah yes, the good old days of the Iron Curtain, the Berlin Wall of the Cold War. When nuclear destruction hung over all of our heads, more so than it does today. This no-nonsense attitude fades as you move towards the northern area of the province as you venture amidst the fog which envelops the Alps. When darkness falls and the mist obscures the moon, the elderly like to resurrect old stories of witches, monsters, 
and dangerous creatures lurking in the woods. But Yara had no time for such silly tales. She wasn't a child anymore, she was 13. She had her circle of friends, her phone, albeit not a fancy smartphone, and most of all, her passion gymnastics, which she practiced at very good levels. On Friday, the 26th of November, 2010, 5.15 p.m., Yara said goodbye to her family, left home, and walked the short distance to her gym. She had been training for gymnastics displays to take place the following Sunday. But that night, she wasn't meant to be training. All she was to do was drop a boombox, a portable stereo, off with her instructor. She should have been back at home well before dinner time. But by 7 p.m., she had not returned, and her parents we're getting anxious. I hate this. This is one of those things, right? Where as a parent, I'm like, yeah, of course, just pop over to the school and drop off the boombox. And my logical mind will be screaming in my mind, everything's fine. Statistically, this is fine. Everything's going to be fine. You don't have to worry about anything. Statistically, it's not going to happen to you. And then you're like, yeah, but people also win the lottery, don't they? Don't drop off that boombox. I'm going to drive you there. <laughs> You know, and then it's like, then you shelter your kids and it's like, oh my God. So what am I supposed to do? Like not shelter my kids. So they're more like balanced and normal and not, and risk them getting kidnapped by like pedophile murderers. And you're like, no, what am I supposed to do? At 7.11 PM, Yara's mother, Maura, a school teacher, tried to ring her, but she only got voicemail. At half past the hour, Yara's father, building surveyor Fulvio, went searching for her in the area around the gym. When he couldn't find her, at 8.30 p.m., he entered the local station of the Carabinieri. This is a police force similar to the French gendarmerie, particularly active and present in smaller centers and rural areas. Thanks, Arnaldo. It's brilliant. So you take the name of the Italian police. It's like, no, 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 it's exactly like the French version. Assuming that, oh yeah, I'm super familiar <laughs> with the French police more than the Italians. Is this like, I don't know, use UK or American terms. The, the UK ones I'm familiar with because I'm from the UK. The American ones I'm familiar with because of, well, movies. The sergeants on duty activated the so-called CARO system. This enables police forces to locate a citizen's private phone without requiring authorization from a public prosecutor. Whoa! What? I mean, that's amazing in this case, but that also feels like... Uh, okay. Dude, that's awesome. The system is not as sophisticated as more accurate analysis put in place when a prosecutor's office does give its blessing, but the sergeant was able to nonetheless identify that Yara's mobile phone had been active in the area and had latched onto the local network at 6.55 p.m., and then the signal had gone dead. The local carabinieri took the matter very seriously and immediately notified the public prosecutor office in Bergamo, who would oversee the investigations. The prosecutor on duty was Mrs. Letizia Regeri, a tenacious sleuth who would not have been out of place in a crime TV drama. A single mother with a black belt in karate, Regeri was a former police officer who had fought against the mafia in Sicily before becoming a magistrate some 15 years later. It's a fairly badass career right there. Within minutes of receiving the report, Regeri dispatched a joint team of Carabinieri and State Police to Brembate to investigate Yara's disappearance. I like this so far. Normally the police are like, oh, I mean, just not, I don't want to say normally the police. I don't know how overall the statistics bear it out, but look, 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 casual criminalist, what do we expect? It's like, oh yeah, no, my 13 year old daughter's gone missing. She went to drop off a boombox and she didn't come home. Ah, oh, just, I would wait at least three days before we do something about that. <laughs> 13 years old, she's probably just off on an adventure. Why is this fine? No, I like this. Good on you, police. Let's f go. By questioning the staff of the gym and analyzing mobile phone records, investigators put together a timeline of Yara's movements until she vanished. At 5.30 p.m., Yara had entered the gym, she handed over the, the stereo to her instructor, and then had sat down to watch a training session. At 6.25 p.m., Yara received a text message from a gymnast friend. At 6.45 p.m., Yara replied to the message, and sometime before 6.50, she was seen walking out of the gym. At 6.55, her mobile latched onto a local network cell, as confirmed by the sergeant sergeant, and then she vanished without leaving a trace. CCTV footage from the nearby bank and petrol station did not reveal anything of interest. Some eyewitnesses reported seeing two men just outside the gym standing next to a red car. Possibly they'd been talking to Yara. As we know, eyewitness reports tend to be vague and unreliable, therefore investigators dismissed these sightings and focused on searching for clues at home. Yeah, I, I mean, 
this is the thing it seems like obvious that that's the lead you should pursue but eyewitness stuff is just we sit on the show all the time it's notoriously bad and it doesn't seem to ever lead anywhere but maybe just leave one cop on it and i get the feeling because arnaldo brought it up that maybe it's going to lead to something let's see a search into yara's personal life and habits did not reveal anything untoward she was a good student quite popular at school although she spent more time with her friends at the gym everything was fine at home no latent conflicts with her parents her two younger brothers and certainly not with her older sister kiba with whom she shared a passion for gymnastics as i said she did not have a smartphone and did not entertain friendships on social networks her internet searches were exclusively related to homework or to her beloved sport all things considered investigators ruled out that yara could have run away from home voluntarily could it be that yara had engineered the delivery of the stereo to the gym so that she could meet with someone in secret someone who may have abducted her no because i don't think so because she went to do a task it's like okay so she'd have to arrange that which is unlikely and so what she'd have to have taken the boombox home previously she'd have to have a reason for that and also then she just sticks around to watch a gymnastics training session for an hour rather than doing whatever illicit thing she went off to do seems extremely unlikely well no initially it was her sister kiba who she was due to take the boombox to the sports center yara had volunteered to go on her behalf at the last minute totally prosecutor regeri then called in the too often unsung heroes of police departments tracker dogs in this case a local breed of italian bloodhounds with their slender bodies comically long ears and mournful eyes these doggos may not appear as much of a threat to the underworld but if i ever commit a crime i hope not to find myself on the wrong end of their sniffing snouts yeah this is one thing like sniffer dogs in movies is always like oh no because i'm always like in movies right the people always flee into the woods and then they run and then they run and they run i just be like just hide just hide but then they'll get the d- although if you're running it depends who you're running away from if you're running away from the police then they're gonna get those dogs and those dogs are gonna find you you need to get in a car like or into a lake or some shit. how do people like escape sniffer dogs lakes and cars right because you get in the car and then you drive away and then you get out somewhere else and the trail is broken and also by getting in a lake i guess it washes off all your scents um again tips for criminals you're welcome i watched a lot of csi i watched a lot of csi like my teenage years were just watching csi vegas like that was the, that was the jam that and star trek and then uh the other one that wasn't as good but was it was a bit more silly what was it um uh, csi miami with david caruso Ow! <laughs> and he puts on his sunglasses love that Canine handlers placed objects belonging to Yara under their ultra-sensitive nostrils and then followed their searches, starting from the area around the gym. The expectation was for the hounds to head towards Yara's home, but instead, one of them, called Joker, nice detail there, Arnaldo, confidently dragged his human partner towards a construction site in the district district of Mapello, some four kilometers to the west. Holy <laughs> Four kilometers on foot? Mrs. Regeri at this point authorized the wiretapping of hundreds of mobiles which had been flagged as passing through Mapello on the day of the vanishing. That is f- sweeping. I don't know how I feel about all of this because I'm like, generally, a kid has gone missing. We should be doing whatever is necessary to find this person. But just the, yeah, 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 no, just uh, listen to hundreds of people's private conversations um, feels a bit like, really? We sh- it feels a bit, you've always got to balance that with the that invasion of privacy right and this that feels pretty intense investigators sifted through thousands of recorded conversations until a sinister sentence stood out it had been spoken in arabic language at the end of november an interpreter translated this sentence as god forgive me i didn't kill her oh my god (laughs) okay find that person bring him in for god's sake get them in i guess this is the thing like with those wiretapping of hundreds of things what i'd be worried about is like not worried because you know it's one of those things that you never <laughs> is gonna go to anything but it's like you know someone who's definitely not me being like hey yeah no I'd, i i would uh i would you know need to need a little bit more weed or whatever and then it's like the police are looking for a missing girl and then they're listening to like someone buying drugs and you're like <laughs> can the police do something with that <laughs> I, I hope that it, they'd just be like, no, let's find the missing girl and not worry about the dude who's uh, buying some pot. The search continues. 
Was her a reference to Yara? And if he had indeed not killed her, could she be held captive somewhere in the province? The phone and the voice belonged to a Moroccan builder called Mohamed Fikri. When the police had stumbled upon this lead, it was the 5th of December and Fikri was on a ship sailing to Tangiers. Italian authorities were able to intercept the boat nonetheless. F Italian authorities! Go, go, go! And Fikri was taken into custody. Proper stuff here. His van was searched and detectives found a bloodstained mattress. As Prosecutor Rigieri later stated, Mohamed Fikri appeared as the perfect suspect, or rather, many wanted him to be the perfect suspect. Some clues, albeit vague, pointed towards his responsibility. He was an outsider, a foreign worker in an area where Poles are dominated by Northern League Party, traditionally opposed to immigration. Um, I'm not sure how that points to his responsibility, Arnaldo. I think that points towards people pointing towards his responsibility. I'm assuming that's just left out there, or that's what you're trying to imply, rather than like, No, he's an immigrant, he's guilty! <laughs> Vickery, however, was quickly released. Forensic analysis of the blood on the mattress proved that it did not belong to Yara plot twist. Moreover, he had an ironclad alibi had been working at the site on the night of the disappearance. So what did you mean when you said you didn't kill her? Who did you kill? Whose DNA is all over your mattress? Finally, and I mean blood DNA. Not the other DNA, that's all I did. <laughs> Simon, why? Why go there? Finally, it appeared that the incriminating sentence had been mistranscribed and mistranslated. What it actually said was, God, please let her pick up the phone. Oh. Okay, well, whoever mistranslated that was involved in intercepting a boat, bringing this guy back, interrogating him. It's like, you're going to be like, oh man, I just wasted so much police money. Ah. Yara's parents, Fulvio and Mora, still harbored hopes of finding their daughter despite ominous rumors, mainly anonymous, reaching the ears and eyes of prosecutors in the press. For example, in mid December, a masseuse reported a conversation with one of her clients who claimed that local sleaze bags had been prowling sports centers in the area, approaching preteen and teen girls. Or in early January 2011, an anonymous letter compli compiled with cut out letters was delivered to a newspaper. It simply stated, Yara is in the Mapello construction site. I am scared. Two weeks later, another unsigned letter was sent to a news outlet. The author claimed to be a previous offender who could not stand those who harm children. Uh, what? <laughs> so, are you out? Did you kill the person who did this? The offender encouraged the Carabinieri to search thoroughly through the Mapello site for Yara. He added that if the officers found Yara, he would give them clues to solve a cold case dating back to 1984, the disappearance of soldier Pietro Kameda from his barracks. I should specify, whoa, 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 you just said this dude from your barracks? Isn't that narrowing it down from basically every dude in the north of Italy, or Italy, or even foreigners, as we already looked at, to a very... How many people live in a barracks? A hundred? Thousands? Either way, it's narrowed it down considerably. I should specify that this latter one was completely unrelated, even geographically, to Yara's disappearance. Yeah, it also was in 1984. This is taking place in 2010. She was 13. She was born in 1997. Even if this and other messages could be easily filed under crank, it made sense to search the construction works at Mapello. The prosecutors did just that, but their searches were fruitless. In fact, scores of officers and volunteers had combed the entire area surrounding Brembert, but Yara seemed to have disappeared without a trace. But very often, chance can achieve better and quicker results than the most coordinated of efforts. <laughs> yeah, but that doesn't mean don't do anything. It's like that classic, it's like, nah, 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 we'll just stumble upon the answer to this case. So let's have a coffee and a donut. <laughs> it's like, you know, what's that quote? Uh, the harder I work, the luckier I get. And it's like, yeah, obviously luck is a factor. It's a big factor. But so is work. <laughs> the lengthening of the shadows. Now, I'd like you to picture the drabbest of settings, the saddest landscape in the world. We're our, we are in a patch of unkempt scrubland covered in tall, wavy grass and thick bushes. All around us are unappealing industrial buildings of grey concrete. Further in the distant, the ever-present, ever-watching, ever-indifferent mass of the Alps reflects the dying light of the day. The sun is starting to set over this winter afternoon, 26th of February 2011. From above our heads comes a persistent, high-pitched drone, the wine of a giant mosquito. But this is Kinoalo, a village 10 kilometers south of Brem Bart. Um, there's a mosquito, a giant mosquito in February in Italy? That sucks. And it's not a tropical marshland. The oversized insect you've just heard is a radio control model airplane. There we go. That makes sense. 
That's why there's, there's no mosquitoes in February. After a last display of miniature acrobatics, the plane makes a crash landing on the scrubland. Its owner is middle-aged Mr. Ilario Scotty. He strides across the brush to pick up the craft. As he does so, he notices a bundle of rags strewn among the weeds. But something in the shape of this bundle forces him to look again. Shadows are stretching across the valley and cold grip clenches Ilario's insides. He picks up his mobile phone and dials three digits. 113. Police emergencies. Wait, 113 is police emergencies? Oh, eh, what is it? It's, uh, oh god, I can't remember the emergency number in my own country. Oh, 115. 158 is the police, but 112 rather than 113 is the European, like, you can dial that anywhere in Europe and you'll be put through. So you don't, you know, wherever you are, you don't have to remember, like, each country's individual code. In the UK, it's 999. In America, it's 911. <laughs> What a fascinating tangent, Simon. Thanks for all of this. He was brilliant. He was outstanding in every way. In a kinder, fairer world, Mr. Scotty would have called the police only to report a bad case of fly tipping. But on that afternoon, 26th of February 2011, exactly three months after Yara's disappearance, the amateur aviator uttered six words we all hope we'll never have to speak. I found a dead body. Later that afternoon, lead prosecutor Letizia Rigari received a phone call from the police notifying her that a body had been found in Kinealo. Whatever rope was left inside the Gambarasios was shattered by an early inspection of the body. It belonged to a teenage girl, and although her features were unrecognizable, the clothes and orthodontic braces were unquestionably Yara's. The scrublands area in Kinealo had been previously searched by police and volunteers, and it was frequented day and night by joggers, dog walkers, and patrons of a nearby dance club, the Quicklands. And yet the tall, unkempt tangle of thorny bushes had concealed Yara's body from everyone's sight until chance had decided that Mr. Scotty's plane had to land near her. The coroner, Professor Christina Cataneo, set to work on a detailed report, which I'll do my best to translate. The body lay supine, with the head leaning to the left, arms partially contracted, legs extended and spread apart. She wears a black jacket with a zipper closed but up to the abdomen. In the right pocket, an MP3 player with headphones, two keys, a SIM card, and a pair of gloves and phone battery. So, a similar battery, but no phone. The report goes on, explaining how the abdominal area was generally well preserved, while the face, head, and legs presented a widespread skeletonization. It was apparent that Yara had been violently attacked. She had suffered a blow to the head before being stabbed with a sharp tool. Sharp tool. She had cuts on her neck, wrists, thorax, back and right leg. Further small cuts on the cuffs of her jacket suggested that Yara the Brave had tried to fight off her attacker. The report also mentioned further cuts on her leggings and underwear. Her bra had been unhooked, all clues which, unfortunately in these cases, may suggest the ultimate revolting violence that could be perpetrated against a child. Professor Cataneo, however, confirms that even though an assault may have been attempted, Ara had been spared that additional torture. Cataneo also confirmed that Yara had died where she had been found. One of her hands, in fact, clutched a nearby tuft of grass, grass shortly before dying. But something that Cataneo could not conclusively confirm was the cause of death, as the numerous wounds appeared too superficial to have caused any fatal blood loss. The coroner's suggestion was that poor Yara had first suffered a massive shock due to the blow to the head and the stab wounds. She had then been left in the Kinealo field, where she had quickly succumbed to exposure in the freezing November evening. Based on the contents of her stomach, time of death was estimated to be around 10pm on the 26th of November. If you allow me to interpret the medical report, Yara had died of fear and of cold, stranded among the thorns. The loneliest being in the universe, a few dozen meters away from the dance club. A flame fading away, unseen. A ball throw away from the dog walkers, on their last outing of the day. The autopsy revealed the presence of further interesting clues. Yara's wounds were compatible with the blade of a cutter rather than a knife, specifically one of those used by tilers. Her body presented traces of lime, not the fruit, but the construction material. The coroner also found on her clothes traces of jute, the vegetable fibre used to make ropes, but also to fashion the heavy-duty sacks used by building contractors. Let's go hunting for building contractors. This is an industrial area. There's going to be many nearby. It's one of them. Let's find them and let's put them in prison forever. And there was more. Tiny metallic spheres, a few microns in diameter. To clarify how small a micron is, consider that a human hair measures 50 microns in diameter. The carabinieri of the RIS, the scientific investigation unit, searched Yara's home, her gym, and the Kinielo 
field for traces of lime and metallic spheres, but could not find any. Where they did find traces of both elements was the Mapello construction site, although the metallic microspheres appeared to have a different composition. So in case it wasn't obvious, all of the clues pointed to the culprit being in the building trade and having worked a Mapello. The RIS then proceeded to collect DNA samples from Yara's skin and clothes. In a CSI episode, it usually only takes a quick montage for investigators to find the right specimen, extract usable DNA, and match it in some database, a few quick edits against an upbeat soundtrack, and voila! Yeah, I was gonna say, you got that bag of <laughs> and then they're dripping some liquid in a bottle. Love that. Time for some arrests. Seriously, one wonders why police forces around the world do not hire more film editors and electric music composers. Conviction rates would soar. With her experience with the casual criminals, Jen will make an ace addition to any forensics investigation team. Yeah. I don't I don't think that this actually speeds up the process though. It's their fictional technology which does. But in the real world it takes hours, days, weeks of painstaking laborious work to test square millimeter by square millimeter for a usable sample of genetic material which then needs to be processed and compared to existing samples in the police databases. And if there are no matches investigators have to collect an identifiable control sample from a person linked to the case which requires authorization from magistrates and tons of paperwork. And so the RA team did just that. By the end of April 2011, they connected four DNA specimens which they labeled Man 1, Man 2, Woman 1, Woman 2. The first three specimens found on Yara's gloves were compared with Yara's friends and family, and with 5,700 samples of saliva specifically collected for the case from citizens in the Brembart area. No match was returned. Yeah, because the people who are giving the samples of saliva are going to be the ones who are not guilty. Because if you're guilty, you'll be like, no, I'm not giving you some my saliva. What are you talking about? And that is a completely fair thing. Like, I don't think that necessarily means you are guilty. It just means you don't want your DNA to be put in a police database for whatever reason. I think that's that's fine. Like, people are entitled to not do that. The fourth sample collected on the sleeve of Yara's jacket did come back with a match. It belonged to Ms. Sylvia Brenner, Yara's gym coach. The police questioned and wiretapped Sylvia and her family. Unsurprisingly, she was cleared of any suspicion. Yeah, I, I think it was extremely unlikely that it would be her, and she's got reasonable reason to have her DNA on her body, um, on Yara's body. But thorough police work, I like it. In May 2011, the RIS scored another potential breakthrough. They found another usable sample, this time belonging to a man on Yara's underpants. While it was normal to find DNA specimens on a victim's gloves or jacket, it was way more significant to identify traces on a victim's underwear. Prosecutors thought that they had a very, very promising lead on their hands, and this unknown sample and his owner was identified as unknown male one. Unknown male. What followed was Italy's and probably Europe's largest scale collection of DNA samples in the context of criminal investigation. Prosecutor Ruggieri mobilized both police forces at her disposal. The Carabinieri tracked phone records identifying all mobile phone users, which had moved from Brembant to Kinielo on the 26th of November 2010. The list of users was handed over to the state police, who tracked them down and collected DNA samples. By the end of the investigation, forensic technicians would sample some 30,000 citizens. But by early 2011, a match had not been found yet. Next, Ruggieri sent her sleuths to the quicksands, the dance club close to where Yara had been found. The club had been linked to a violent death back in January. The case was unrelated, but it could be an indication that the club was frequented by unsavory characters. What investigators found was that the club owners oh, were sticklers for paperwork. Access was allowed only to card-carrying members, all carefully recorded, so the police could track down all of the regular patrons. As usual, they were all swabbed and their DNA tested against unknown one. Finally, investigators got a break. One of the samples from the clubbers bore a close similarity to Mr. Unknown One. It wasn't a 100% match, but close enough for geneticists to establish that this guy was a close relative of the murderer. That's what's going to get you. Like, this is, isn't this what got the, was it the Golden State Killer? Who's like, you know, uh, they ran it through like the Ancestry DNA or whatever. I don't want to say, I don't know if it was Ancestry DNA. One of these DNA companies, don't want to say which one, because I guess there's probably issues there about privacy and all of this stuff but like they found it was it his brother or his cousin or some like that and then they're like okay cool well that just narrowed down our pool it's someone related to you and i'm like that's crazy the guy in question was one damiano guirioni who happened to be the son of one mrs zanny who happened to have worked as a cleaning lady for the gambarassios 
Wait, so this is... Okay, so this is the son of their cleaning lady. So their cleaning lady is a relative. She could be... Oh my, that's a twist. Could that be a connection? Ruggieri was not convinced, but to be on the safe side, she, quote, had them followed, grilled them, and tortured them. Holy what? <laughs> Which I should specify was just a figure of speech, however unfortunate. Good luck. If you're a police officer, don't use torture and interrogation together in a sentence, even if it's a joke. Just don't, because it will get taken out of context, and that's not a good time. Ruggieri meant that she had Damiano and his mum thoroughly questioned and wiretapped until she could safely rule them out from the suspects list. So, the connection between Damiano and Yara was pure coincidence. A red herring. Ruggieri decided to refocus on Damiano's DNA instead, reconstructing his ancestry and identifying which relative of his many may have been the culprit. That is a hell of a coincidence. I mean... If, uh, if Arnaud hadn't been like, this was a coincidence, I'd be like, that's not a coincidence. What are the chances that the DNA found on the victim just so happens to be related to the victim's family's cleaning lady? Come on. A team of geneticists spent months tracing upwards through the Guerrioni family, going as far back as the year 1716. Can't we look at the DNA? This is quite recently. I mean, what, it's 10 years ago? I feel like DNA technology, I'm sure it's come a long way in the last 10 years, but still it was pretty good like 10 years ago, right? Can't you look at that DNA sample and be like, oh, it's like, that's a brother, that's, or like close enough to be a brother, close enough to be a mother, close enough to be a cousin, second cousin, etc. Surely we have some like idea of where this person is as not to need to go back to 1716, right? Fascinatingly, but probably not strictly necessary, as the murderer was more likely someone closer in time to the 21st century. As part of their genetic profiling efforts, investigators needed to acquire a DNA sample also from Damiano Gironi's paternal uncle called Giuseppe. The problem was that he had died in 1999. Undeterred, detectives searched his widow's house in September 2011 and found two stamps that had licked. The traces of saliva on the stamps were analyzed, and geneticists were convinced to have found an even closer match match. Giuseppe Garoni was the father of Unknown One. Giuseppe had two sons, which were promptly swabs and promptly exonerated as the results were negative. Okay. So, was that another dead end? Maybe for another prosecutor, but not for Rigieri. She wondered, could it be that Unknown One was Giuseppe's illegitimate son? Yes, possible. Uh, another possibility would be that he has a identical twin. The, the father has an identical twin who has his own son separated at birth maybe adopted maybe something like that identical twin knocking around out there perhaps is that just way too speculative and unlikely i don't know illegitimate son's probably more likely isn't it yeah it is because <laughs> there's lots of illegitimate children um but not so many uh, identical twins you are always trying to confuse us with this Big words. She launched an investigation within the investigation. Her teams on the ground now had to locate a woman, presumably rather elderly, who had had an affair with a man who had been dead for 12 years. Investigators learned that since the 1960s, Giuseppe had taken annual trips to a spa resort south of Milan without his wife. Could a furtive romance amongst the springs sprung this elusive offspring? In early 2012, detectives sifted through the spa records, shortlisting all single women who had stayed at the resort while Giuseppe was there. In parallel, they visited orphanages, hospices, and homes for fallen women, i.e. single mothers looking for any trace of Giuseppe's lover. They didn't call it fallen women in 2012, did they, Italy? Come on. <laughs> After exhausting all leads, they realized that they had been working under the assumption that unknown number one had been conceived by a woman who was single at the time. But what if Giuseppe's mistress was married too? What if she had raised unknown one as the legitimate child of her husband? When word got out the police and Carabinieri were looking for evidence of an extramarital affair, local newspapers were flooded by anonymous letters claiming that so-and-so was not really the son of such-and-such, and, such, and that this guy and that were cuckolds and their wives were... Let's just say very open and friendly. Oh my god, there's going to be way too much stuff to go through because it's like every small town rumor is just going to fly into that police station. 
Now that the gossip floodgates had been opened, it was time for a good old-fashioned investigator to enter the fray and sift through the dirt for any golden nuggets of information. This was Giovanni Moserino. He was a warrant officer with the Carabinieri and right-hand man to Prosecutor Rigieri. At this stage, the investigation dragged on for months, as Giovanni questioned every friend, colleague, or acquaintance of the late Giuseppe Garioni. He learned that Giuseppe had been a bus driver for a local public transport company, and as such, had driven hundreds of young women to and from textile factories in the area. Plenty of opportunities for affairs then. In fact, two of Giuseppe's colleagues confirmed the dealer reputation of being something of a womanizer as they described him a man with a capital M. <laughs> <laughs> I assume in Italian. In March 2013, one of the colleagues reported to Officer Moserino that Giuseppe had indeed gotten pregnant, a young married lady, but he did not know her name. It wasn't until June 2014 that a source whose identity was protected by Officer Moserino came forward and revealed who could have been the mother of Unknown One. She had indeed been a textile worker traveling on Giuseppe's bus. More importantly, she had also been his neighbor. Her name was Esther Azufi. Known male. Esther had married in 1966, aged just 19, with Mr. Gianni Bassetti. The two had been neighbors of Giuseppe while living in Ponte Selva, a village some 50 kilometers north of Brembat. It appeared that the Bassettis were an ill-matched couple. She was pretty outgoing and unconventional. He was much colder and a more introverted character as a result of suffering for, from psoriasis, arthritis, and depression. It was therefore realistic that Esther may have pursued extramarital affairs following the lead uncovered by warrant officer Moserino Regan. Gary's team realized that they'd already acquired Esther's DNA back in July 2012 as part of their blanket collection campaign. And the DNA had already been cross-checked with the unknown one sample, but the test had been returned negative. It could have ended there, but Rigari's geneticist double-checked the initial test and realized that there had been a mistake. It turns out that the sample belonging to unknown one was not entirely clean. It had been contaminated with some of Yara's genetic material. Back in 2012, Esther's DNA had been compared to mitochondrial DNA present with the unknown one sample. This is the standard practice when comparing female to male samples as mitochondria are normally inherited from their mother. But due to the contamination, Esther's material had been compared to Yara's mitochondrial DNA, hence the test had returned negative. Wait, wait what? Okay, I have to say I'm a little bit lost with that, but for some reason they tested this woman's Esther, who was the wife of the... So Esther was the wife of the dude who was having, she got pregnant while having an affair, um, and then they tested her DNA previously, but it was not a match. But then they realized there was a mistake, so they're testing her DNA again, and that's where we are now. The comparison was run again, and this time geneticists working under Dr. Emiliano Godina uh, found that, yes, Esther was the mother of unknown male number one. Okay, looking into Esther's background, Rigari and Moserino found that she and her husband had left their hometown of Ponte Selva in 1970. Shortly afterwards, Esther had given birth to twins, a boy and a girl. The twins had been raised by Esther and her husband Gianni as their own, but of course the biological father was the philandering Giuseppe Garioni. Prosecutors now focused their investigation on the male twin, obviously. His name was Massimo Giuseppe Bassetti. Please note the middle name, Giuseppe. Okay. Back in 2014, Massimo Bassetti was age 44. He was a married man with three children who loved to party and sported a fashionable goatee and a tan complexion. But what mattered to the police were two details. He was a builder by trade, and he lived in Mapello, near the site where the joke where Joker the Bloodhound had followed the trail four years prior. Rigari now had to take the final step to confirm that Bassetti was indeed her unknown number one. So that's a lot of information. Um they found Esther. They tested her again because there was a mistake. It turns out that she is the mother of the person who left the DNA on Yara. They found who that person is, the son, illegitimate son, uh, who's living his life. He works at the construction site, which had, and there were all the, um, that trace evidence on Yara that tie it to construction. So it seems very likely that it's going to be him. They've got to get a sample from him to confirm it, right? So they've got to arrest this dude. Let's go. And to do so, she had to acquire a sample of Bassetti's DNA without alarming him. So she devised a cunning trap. Why can't we alarm him? Go f***ing arrest him. FBI, open up. Get him in the f***ing van. Get him to the police station. Swab his cheek and run that DNA. You'll find it matches. And then you prosecute him and send him to prison for the rest of his life. Easy. <laughs> Why do we need to keep it quiet?
What's he going to do? Run away? Maybe he'd run away. Yeah, you should probably try and run away. But also, running does running away work? <laughs> like, this guy's just a regular dude. How far are you going to get before the police are like, Mate, get in the f***ing van. <laughs> On June the 15th, 2014, her officer set up a fake roadblock pretending to be spot-checking drivers. They pulled over Bassetti's car and asked him to test for alcohol consumption levels with a breathalyzer. The man complied. Of course, officer. Well, thank you, sir. Would you mind breathing into this mouth, please? So blast and tarnation. Would you believe that my breathalyzer machine's not working properly today? Would you mind breathing into this second mouth, please? Most kind. This clever ruse ensured that Rigeri had two good samples from Bassetti just to be on the safe side. The saliva droplets were tested that very same night by Dr. Gi Dr. Giardina. If they've just got one, and it's like, then it's just, they, you've already got enough evidence to arrest him, no? Come on! Let's go! This judge earlier was like, yeah, 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 wiretap hundreds of phones. And it's like, well, we're, uh, we're almost certain it's genetically this dude. Can you allow us to arrest him? No. <laughs> Come on, why not? It had taken almost four years of extensive, painstaking investigations, but finally forensic science had won. As the report landed on Regeri's desk, she learned that Bassetti and unknown male number one were an exact match. See, that's where the episode of CSI would end. It's like, ow! Or whatever. And, but in real life, there's the, the next important part where defense lawyers try to tear apart the entire investigation and poke holes in it and probably get their clients off because you got to get it all beyond all no reasonable doubt, right? Anyway. The Trial Regeri was torn. On one hand, she wanted her officers to follow Bassetti at a distance, study his movements, his habits, and collect more evidence. What were you got? DNA! Let's go! Come on! On the other hand, she realized if word got out of the DNA match, Bassetti might try to escape abroad. Eventually, she made up her mind. On the 16th of June, officers arrested Massimo Bassetti and charged him with the murder of Yara. The press and public opinion had so much invested in this case that the Italian Ministry of the Interior personally broke the news to media outlets. Following the arrest, Bassetti obviously contested his innocence. His defense lawyers explained the presence of DNA on the body of Yara by claiming that some of his work tools had been recently stolen. Their client suffered from regular nose bleeds, and all his tools were stained in blood. Jesus. Bassetti's wife, Marita, also offered an alibi, claiming that he had been at home on the night of the murder. But in the meantime, investigators uncovered more circumstantial evidence that could be used against the number one suspect. Phone records showed that Bassetti's mobile had been switched off at 5.45 p.m. on the evening of Yara's abduction and been turned on again only the morning after. At the moment of going off, the phone had latched on to a cell located in in Brembat. A further look at the CCTV footage proved that his van had been driving around Yara's home and gym before the disappearance. Dude, you're going to prison. His regular presence in the area had been confirmed by the staff of a tanning shop and local news agents. And then Bassetti's internet search history demonstrated that he had an unhealthy interest in preteen girls. The camera binary of the RIS, the scientific investigation unit, set to work to analyze both Bassetti's van and his work tools. Initially, they had to admit that he couldn't find any trace of Yara's, but their meticulous inspect inspections returned a solid result. On the 18th of February 2015, they informed the media that fabric samples collected from Bassetti's van suits were compatible with fibers found on Yara's clothing. Nine days later, Rigari formally indicted Massimo Bassetti for the voluntary, aggravated murder of Yara Gambaracio. The trial started on the 3rd of July 2015. In the meantime, the alibi offered to Bassetti by his wife, Marita, had been shattered. During a meeting in prison, authorities had wiretapped a conversation between the two spouses. Marita had just learned that Massimo's van had been filmed while prowling the streets around Yara's gym, and she told Massimo, you were there. You can't just drive around there for 45 minutes unless you were waiting for someone, and then you never told me what you did that evening. I don't remember what time you came home. I can't remember. In other words, Bassetti had been home on the night of the murder, but probably only after it had been committed. Moreover, Marita herself was now suspicious of her husband. At the trial, the defense team clutched onto technicalities, claiming that Bassetti's DNA, DNA sample had been collected unlawfully. The proceedings dragged on for a year. On the 1st of July 2016, the Court of Assizes of Bagame found Massimo Giuseppe Bassetti guilty of the murder of Yara Gambarasio. The motive was described as an attempted approach of sexual nature, which had escalated into deadly violence. Bassetti was sentenced to life in prison. Excellent news. And let us just hope that life in prison for a sentence like this means life. Not like, oh, well, yeah, it is 20 years, but with good behavior, the prisons are really full. You could be out in 12. Maybe 10. And it's like, that is not right. That is not right. This guy needs to uh, be in prison forever. 
until he dies. The Italian judiciary system allows for defendants to appeal one last time, and Bassetti's lawyers did just that. The basis for their case was that prosecutors had mishandled the genetic material on Yara's clothes, the sample labeled Unknown Male One. They went as far as claiming that it was all a conspiracy plotted by prosecutors to force a match to Bassetti's DNA. In October 2018, the Court of Cassation dismissed the idea of a conspiracy as a conjecture worthy of science fiction. Yeah, when your defense lawyers are spinning a conspiracy, it's like you're <laughs> that was the final wrap of the gavel, which sealed Bassetti's fate. Conclusion Yara was buried in the local cemetery, just across the road from her gym, resting between the graves of her grandparents. During the duration of the inquiry and subsequent trial, Yara's parents maintained a very low profile, preferring dignified silence to outward manifestations of grief. After the initial sentence in 2016, her mother, Mora, released a very simple statement to the press Now we know who did it, although we are conscious that nobody can give us Yara back. This is, of course, true, even when justice is served. It can't erase the injustice of outliving your child. But as the father of a 13-year-old girl myself, I like to think that at the very least the outcome of this investigation may deter future monsters from preying on other Yaras. Yeah, uh, that's Arnaldo with the 13-year-old. Mine is two and a half and half. So, yeah, I mean, this is it. That DNA is going to get you and whether it's a huge collection effort like this and now all those samples are on the record so it's going to be harder than it's going to be easier the next time and don't forget all of those you know dna ancestry websites they're out there every day processing what tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of samples and adding people to a big database that when a crime like this is committed some judge is going to be like yeah you're going to need to give us those samples and your third cousin is going to be on there and they're going to narrow that pool of suspects down from hundreds of thousands or millions to like 12 and then they're going to come for you and then they're going to arrest you and they're going to put you in prison forever or put a needle in your arm so just bear that in mind criminals all right and i may have a too optimistic view of my country's institutions but i'm hopeful that when a state decides to invest to deploy the full might of its resources and especially the best that science has to offer then there is nowhere left for monsters to hide yeah unfortunately monsters despite all of this do successfully hide but less and less so because of this fascinating thing called dna let's go lock them up dismembered appendix Back in 2013, investigative journalist Roberto Saviano issued some claims linking Yara's case to organized crime. It would be a casual criminalist set in Italy if we didn't mention organized crime, would it? Saviano achieved notoriety with his non-fiction book, Gamora, an inquest into the crimes and, and dealings of the Camorra, mafia's equivalent for Naples. His book spawned two successful pieces of fiction, a film and TV series also called Gamora. Saviano's inquiries have proved invaluable to prosecutors in their fight against the Camorra, so much so that the journalist is in the syndicate's permanent hit list and lives under police protection. That's why being a journalist sucks. Like I always said, I don't want to be a journalist. I got no interest in that. Because I don't want to live my life in fear that some dude is going to come up to me while I'm having like dinner somewhere and just like pew, pew, just double tap me with a silencer in the back like in the movies because uh you, you did some investigation that you shouldn't have done F that i'm way too much of a coward <laughs> according to saviano La yara's father fulvio had been working for low power construction company managed by a family involved in drug trafficking saviano claims that fulvio gambriccio had testified against said family which had retaliated by murdering his daughter there was also a curious coincidence do you remember joke of the bloodhound who had taken the police to the construction site in Mopello? well that site was managed by the Lopav company. However, this line of inquiry had been abandoned in 2014 when Mr. Gambaracio himself declared that he had actually never testified against his former employers. In November 2016, Saviano resurrected his theory in an interview with the weekly magazine, stating that he found it disturbing the prosecutors had not investigated the Lopav angle. Sure, as far as alternative theories go, Saviano's had some legs to stand on, but the subsequent appeal trials and plenty of forensic evidence confirmed the culpability of Bassetti. I almost don't want to say it because it's scary, but that doesn't mean they weren't in, in you know, <laughs> you could tie this together. Mafia, you know, scary organizations, they don't always get their own hands dirty, do they? So, and more than one person can be guilty of a single murder. Let's just leave it at that, shall we? But... <laughs>
<laughs> Jesus. Ending this episode there. Thank you, Arnaldo. Thank you, Jen, who edits this. Did I thank her at the beginning? I'm not sure. Well, thank you, Jen. And uh, I'll see you next time. Leave a review if you fancy it. If you're listening as a podcast, that would be grand. Thanks. And I'll see you next time.